Okay, so as you know, I like to um, pique your interest a little bit with a true-false set of questions, and I'm trying to be very tricky, so beware. First question, during the project-based learning, instructors function as a sage on the stage, true or false? Two, thinking skills and habits of mind are essentially the same thing. Three, students get the most benefit out of project-based learning when they present their findings or products to their classmates. So since you looked into this for homework assignment, maybe you know some of these. The other thing I wanted to mention before we actually get started is that your closure activity for this talk will be to come up with a graphic organizer for project-based learning. I'm going to show you a couple, but I think we can come up with better ones. Anyway, so just so you'll be picturing how you could do that in your head, I thought it might be more effective than surprising you at the end. Project-based learning is some kind of project that the students are assigned that takes at least a week and may take a semester to finish. And what it does typically is develop some kind of authentic project to do that could have a benefit to the community, it could have a benefit to the school, or it could be more fanciful than that. But usually it has some connection with reality. One of the things I thought I would do today as an illustration of project-based learning is to use Adrian Novotny's program that he started with his cultural anthropology class. I interviewed him briefly for this, but basically I found out about it last flex day. And what he does is, um, this is an <coughs> honors class, so it's a, a little bit smaller group than an ordinary class. He brought up the question of the quality of life in Long Beach. Now students can pick their own topics in this quality of life issue. And notice that it's kind of a broad-based question. How are you going to organize your thinking about that? That's actually part of the job for the students. So students are obviously going to be pretty active in trying to get their hands around a project such as this. And they're going to employ whatever knowledge they have, and they're going to find that they need to get some more. So um, again, I want to emphasize that it's an applied setting, and there might be some very good use for the results of the study. So as the learners work on the project, the instructors are going to need to supply scaffolding. And that is some support for the students um, in getting information and resources, maybe connecting them up with people in the field that they're working on so that they might be able to interview those folks and get some information from them. So um, the instructor is the guide on the side on a program that is mostly going to be done by the students. And that's where the engagement happens. This is a kind of a graphic organizer I found that illustrates this sort of nicely. The stage on the sage is the more traditional type of teaching environment. And as we've seen in past talks, about 5% of the information that's lectured on has been shown to be retained by students. So that's not very effective. And then what we're hoping for is that we can set up this project with um, some parameters in advance and then let students work on it and give them feedback and training in that sort of teachable moment. When they need to know some information, you're there um, with them to help them through it so they don't get too frustrated. So students are actively involved. They're doing things. There's no way to sit and be passive and get through this project. And so they're going to be using their active higher order thinking skills on Bloom's taxonomy. A couple of more examples. Students listen to a lecture on monetary or fiscal policy, or they could be looking at a real life economic problem and maybe even taking roles like Ben Bernanke and, um, and other people who are wheeler and dealers and making big decisions um, about current economic crisis that we have as well. And then students could complete a worksheet on Newton's laws, or they can take into account the lesser gravity on the moon and imagine a type of sport that they could do and take advantage and maybe play with that less um, gravity, you know, smaller gravitational pull. Now, Novotny students um, basically did some community service 
and it did catch the attention of the city officials. So they were able to present this to them. And the community services free research time and data for those who are making the decisions for Long Beach. Uh, the project is probably going to be in part designed by the instructor. And in fact, Novotny came up with the idea of looking at the quality of life in Long Beach. But the rest of it is in the hands of the students oftentimes. So they have a lot of leeway and have to make some decisions. So I have a couple of materials that I got from Adrian Novotny that I'll pass around. And some of the things that the students decided had to do with quality of life had to do with law enforcement, water quality, available housing, health care, um, school funding, the Port of Long Beach, um, juvenile crime, drug abuse, geriatric health. And you can see oh, they got into recycling, mental health. And so over a period of years, students have picked some little piece of the quality of life issue to study for Novotny's class, and that became their project. So, and again, I'm using um, Novotny's projects as an example. They targeted Long Beach, and of course, they're, they had in mind talking to the city officials about the results of their research. And I'm going to use as examples housing, um, affordable housing, and access to health care as a couple of the projects that uh, the students worked on. So they defined those subsets of quality of life and then they targeted who they wanted to talk to about it. The project has this concept of need to know. It's not like the need to know in the military, right? Like you don't need to know. But it, what it is is when you have a problem that's posed at, or a project to work on, you realize that you don't have enough information to do it. So you begin a search to gather up the resources and the information you're going to need in order to complete the project. So that's a big advantage of the project, is that the students now want the information rather than feeling like you have decided the information that they need. Um, the idea here is that students are going to learn academic content. So you decide ahead of time what they're going to learn in the project. They're clearly going to build skills. Some of those skills are going to be communication skills, collaboration skills, but they're also going to build some thinking skills, managerial type things. Um, one of my research students did some collaboration with me, and that was a way that I found out about this project going on as well. He had taken research methods the semester before he had Novotny's class, and so he knew I would be a good source of information about how to design his project and how to uh, develop measurable goals and what kind of numbers he was going to end up with to analyze. So he came in to see me and um, you know there goes the collaboration not just with his fellow students but with any other resource he can think of on campus. One of the models that I found in my search to try to um, think of what I was going to present to you was this one and it's kind of a five principle model. It's not the only one out there but it's a pretty straightforward one and so I thought I would share it with you. The first principle suggests that you begin with the end in mind and for the instructor it would be what do I want the students to learn. Um, some projects are done in groups for example but others are done individually. So if you're doing a group project, you're going to have more of the teamwork issue there than you would if you had an individual project. So it would be the instructor who would sort of set that up probably. And then every subject matter has a content as well. So what are, is the core content that the students need to get in order to be competent when they leave the class? And then there's this thing called habits of mind, which I'm going to distinguish from the skills. They, the, they're similar to skills, but it's a little bit different issue. Okay, so the second principle is to develop a driving question. And this is a way to organize what the project's about. So you take the theme, and this is something that maybe the students could even have on a three by five card and kind of keep with them. Very much the way in research methods, we have students um, hang on to their hypothesis. So whenever they get a little fuzzy about what they're doing and designing their project, all they have to do is whip out their hypothesis or the, this organizing question in order to help them refocus. Okay, so 
again, the, the main purpose is to help the students retain focus, but it also, if it's an intriguing question, it's going to grip them. I don't know about you, but the idea of analyzing the quality of life in your own city sounds pretty intriguing to me. Okay, so with guidance from their instructors, students learn how to match up the project outcomes and the assessment strategies. So the third principle is to figure out how you're going to assess progress. Remember that we want to look at content knowledge, so every course has stuff you're supposed to know when you leave, and also skills, so these would be transferable skills that you can take from this subject matter where you pass the class out into your life and use it in other ways, and then these mysterious habits of mind. Okay, so um, you decide what to assess, you um, think of these three as your goal, you know, looking at them and considering these areas, this is considered to be a balanced assessment. Okay, so content mastery is pretty self-explanatory. Most college courses are pretty good at assessing whether people have content mastery. Um, then the skills of habits of mind require things like rubrics, and uh, we're gonna look at a quick performance rubric. Um, they're more qualitative types of measures rather than something you can score with a machine. Okay, so um, I think we've just talked about that already. Let's have a look at a rubric. So this is a teamwork skills rubric. Uh, and, and on the side here, we've got helping, listening, participating, persuading, questioning, respecting, and sharing. And then we have a way to take something that is sort of qualitative to begin with. You're just making observations. But you're um, looking at the amount of time that, they're, that they spend doing this type of thing. Now, this might not be the only way you could organize a teamwork rubric, but at least it gives you an idea of the skills that you'd be looking for, right? Okay, then habits of mind are things that are referred to as a sort of a disposition to engage a problem in a certain way. So uh, those who study critical thinking like Peter Fascioni have differentiated having the skills to do critical thinking and having the inclination to do it, right? So that's what we're talking about here with habits of mind. It's um, thinking about life in a way that's maybe involved critical thinking or creative thinking, innovation, using those skills that you learned about, applying them in your lives. Okay, so like skill assessment, habits of mind require some kind of qualitative measures. And we're going to look at a list of those coming up. But they are going to be things like journaling, peer observation, teacher observation, Okay. And one of the things you can do to measure the habits of mind and the skills are collect artifacts. So these can be any number of things. And I've got a list for you here. Notes, journal entries, descriptions of activities, library search record, email records, telephone logs. Notice that what we're looking at here is not just the end product, which we have too, some kind of performance, some kind of deliverable good. But we're also looking at formative evaluation. So how are we doing? What's the evidence that we evolved on this project, that our thinking became more clear? One of the, the typical things you might do is have a, a beginning model that you leave aside because you have a more sophisticated understanding of what the project's about at a later time. But you would hang on to the original conceptualization of the project as evidence of your progress. Okay, so the fourth principle is map the project, and this involves a sequence of activities, but with the sequence of activities, you have to have a timeline, and it's helpful to have uh, sub-goals along the way, sometimes called benchmarks, sometimes called milestones, where you uh, have reached a certain place, and you can you know, rest a little bit, congratulate yourself, and feel good. Okay, so timelines, um, Milestones and artifacts are all parts of a formulative evaluation, so checking your progress on the way. Okay, timelines, pretty self-explanatory. Milestones are sub-goals along the way, and artifacts are any kind of product, we just saw a whole list of them, that would be evidence of what you've done to come up with your final product. 
in writing classes, of course, we have drafts of uh, papers. We have maybe uh, references where you know you have to have a list of maybe at least five references that you use to compile your research study. Things like that. Okay, so. Um, some types of end products, so we've looked at formative evaluation, now we have summative evaluation. What is the end product that we uh, were going for? And so here we go with some possibilities. You could write a, re a proposal. And one of the things that Novotny students could have done is write a proposal for the city. What they decided to do, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, is um, they decided to grade the city, A, B, C, you know, DRF, on how they were doing with each of these little areas of um, quality of life in the city. So uh, an example of writing a proposal, you might propose a bike path for an area that it's particularly dangerous, let's say, for uh, bicyclists to share the road with motorists. And then inventing, inventing a device, right? So there's a definite deliverable for your project. And so that would be a very nice endpoint. Designing a model, so this could be um, some kind of construction project or I, we've got the example here of building a model of a molecule. <coughs> write a magazine article. Sometimes when my students write a particularly good research project, I encourage them to submit it to either a student uh, conference or the Viking or some place where they can see their uh, information in print if it's highly relevant to some source we can think of. Create an audiovisual or multimedia production would also be one that would be likely to be engaging to students and useful to put on YouTube. Study a plot of land to see uh, what some good uses could be for it and give the results. Propose a law, that's getting pretty, uh, pretty grandiose perhaps, but it's a possibility. You could uh, write a letter to your congressman, propose it. And then student portfolios, we're quite familiar with these in art class, right, where students have to develop a body of work, but this could also be done in writing class in a number of uh, different areas in academia. Okay, as I mentioned, Novotny's anthropology students decided to write a report and to, uh, they met with the mayor and they actually talked over the research results. I think you might be interested, and they gave a C to uh, the city on affordable housing and a C on uh, health care. So the results of the rest of their findings are in this book. I'll just pass it around. Every project that they've done so far over several semesters is there. The grades aren't always C, but in this case they happen to be. A variation I thought was interesting on problem-based learning is that you can do a kind of a challenge or a contest and have various students or student groups compete with each other to see who has the best product. Some benefits then I think we can see to problem-based learning is that there's a good kind of uh, use of material so the, the information that they learn, the content is likely to be stored in long-term memory because it's had sense, it's made sense, it's been meaningful to them. They've also learned skills and hopefully good habits of mind. And then we talked earlier in another session about the difficulty of transfer and how students very often don't see how what they're being expected to learn in class actually is useful in their lives. It's pretty hard to miss it if you do a project such as this because it's involved in the real world. Some pitfalls of doing this type of work are the planning fallacy and this is that Students aren't necessarily going to be good at this stuff, right? They're not managers. And so one of the typical places they might fall down is with allotting enough time. So we can help them with that by having scaffolding in place and expecting them to submit different parts of their project on a certain timeline so that they won't leave it till the end of the semester and then fail to complete 
right? So that's something to look out for. Interestingly enough, this bias only affects our own estimate of how long it's going to take us to do things. When other people are looking at projects, they're much better at estimating the time frame. So that gives the idea that students could consult with their instructor or with other people and get an estimate on how long things should take um, with experts too. Other pitfalls are many times instructors have too high expectations for the amount of content and they don't supply ways to assess it. So everything that you want students to learn, you're going to have to come up with an assessment instrument for it. And then um, st students, this is the uh, last of the true and false questions, will do better if they present their projects to highly relevant people out in the world, right? not just their classmates. So if they can present it as Novotny students did to the city council, then that's pretty hot stuff and it's likely to be highly meaningful experience. Plus they're likely to work really hard to make it professional. And then um, I think it's pretty clear that the instructors have to be there to keep students from floundering because as I said, they're not good at managing, they're not good at establishing timelines. They don't have the content yet, that's why they're in the class. So they're going to need quite a bit of support, but the nice thing about that is that they're going to know they need it and so they'll be eager to get it. Okay, so as I warned you, here's our closure activity. I would like you to work with your buddies to see if you can come up with a graphic organizer to explain some of the key points that we've just talked about, or I've just talked about. Okay? All right, uh, welcome back from the snack. Um, so in uh, 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 honor of the spiral graph, we're gonna do some spiraling here, right? So what we do, is we spiral back to the previous class and to the previous semester to kind of recover things that we've already covered, trace them over, fill in gaps, and provide additional detail. So what we're gonna go back to is work from last time where we talked about the benefits of prediction, of having students generate expectations uh, in the classroom, and it's effects with respect to how students remember and how the brain works. Um, I, when I, one of the ways that I provide um, prediction for my students is I tend to use quotes from literature that I like. It humanizes me a little bit. I don't, I don't know if Austin actually humanizes anyone, but um, it helps them to engage with a different part of me. Uh, and I usually let them engage with it a little bit at a time. And then I usually ask them to think about, well, where is this likely to go, right? In very much the same way that Trisha talked about last time. So this is just a great quote from Austin, one amongst many, about how memory isn't what we think it is, right? That sometimes memory works great, and we can remember anything, any, we can remember something from 30 years ago like it just happened. And other times, when we desperately need it, we can't remember something that literally just happened. Uh, and it captures the vagaries of memory in a really nice way. Um, so, spiraling, how memories are formed. You may remember this from last semester, but basically there's a variety of steps that are critical for a memory to be formed in the first place. Basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to take some external stimulus, something you've seen, heard, touched, felt, uh, tasted, and turn it into some internal representation, right? And there are four critical steps. The first thing is some general pre-attentive analysis that happens largely outside of our awareness. We don't notice it the vast majority of time. It happens very fast. It's this massive sorting of our environment in which we just kind of decide, do I need to actually start to attend to this or not? Then attention, which is what most of us think of as being the important piece. But at this step, right, we've discarded a huge amount of the information in our world, right? We've just decided that so much of what's happening around us, we just don't need to remember. Once we process past that, how do you attend to, or whether or not you attend to? So do you attend to a specific thing? How intensely do you attend to it? The third step is comprehension. If you don't understand it, you can't actually remember it. And then the last step that solidifies memory is elaboration, doing cognitive work on the thing. It turns out that in a lot of cases, I'll come back to this, these two things are happening simultaneously, right? Comprehension is also part of the act of elaboration and vice versa. That is, when you're working on things, 
Comprehension is changing, understanding is changing. When you're comprehending things, you're elaborating. So these steps, though, traditionally talked about separately, often happen in parallel. Okay, so how does generated predictions influence that process? One of the things that Trisha talked about last week is it's essentially the mental equivalent of a prompt. It's something that's telling you, pay attention, right? Something is going to happen. <clears throat> And there's this really remarkable set of work across a variety of subfields of psychology where, where you have something that's incomplete or ongoing that the mind just continues to focus on, right? You generate, intention, uh, you generate attention, you maintain attention, it re-engages mental attention when lost, right? So when you have an incomplete task and you've been distracted by something else, even very important things, right? That incompletion re-engages your intention later uh, in ways that you have very little control over or very little awareness of. And as long as it's incomplete, it continues to send you back to elaborate on it further. Right? What is happening? Why don't I know the answer to this yet? So there's two very cool sets of work. One of uh, dates to the very earliest aspects of psychology. Uh, one of Kurt Lewin's students, Zygarnik, discovered um, when they were out uh, at a restaurant that uh, the wait person could remember the entire party's meals without error. They were stunned. It was this feat, they had like 12 people, it was this feat of really remarkable memory for people that studied memory. They got everything right, they knew exactly what they wanted, exactly how they ordered it, and delivered it to the table. So as memory researchers, they're very interested. How did you do that? Right? Well, how, how, did, how were you able to do that? And so they rush up to him after the meal is over and they try to quiz him and see how much he knows and what exactly he remembers and how they did it. He had no idea. He couldn't explain how he did it. Not only that, he had no idea what people remember, or I'm sorry, what people had ordered anymore. He could not remember. What had happened is the incompletion of the order, right? I have not delivered it yet. I have not achieved the goal kept it all active in memory. When he achieved the goal, gone, right? We all know we have models of this constantly in our classrooms, which are tests, right? The students take the test, they know a lot of things, and then you ask them the next lecture about anything that was on that test that they were studying before, and they've forgotten a lot of it. Well, what? It is painful. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, the other very cool set of work is uh, work by Dan Wegner on uh, non-conscious or ironic monitoring, right? So this grew out of his observations in clinical psych that when people were trying not to think of particular things, they actually thought about it more. And so many of you have probably heard about this research. It's uh, don't think of a pink elephant or don't think of a white bear. And the harder you try to not think of that thing, the harder it is. Is that sort of that resist-persist phenomenon? The more you resist it, the more it persists? Is there anything to that? Well, it, it's built into that, right? So if you, re it's, it's the ongoing, it's, you have an ongoing task that in these cases are never complete. You want to try to never do something or never try and do something. So you have to constantly monitor that task, right? And so even when it falls out of consciousness, you're, there's a variety of non-conscious processes that continue to track. How am I doing on this task that never ends? Right? And that constantly brings it back into consciousness. Right? It's the same kind of thing. When we have something that we know we're supposed to be doing or we're trying to work on or we're trying to think about that's not complete, our mind continually re-engages with that process. Right? And that's essentially what prediction is doing. When you get students to predict things in the classroom, until you provide them with the answer, they're continually engaging with that information. They're going, well, I've predicted an outcome. I don't know the answer. The answer is coming, but I don't know when. Right? So you're, con you're keeping in this constant engaged set of uh, recollection and elaboration. Right? It's a waiting confirmation or closure. Right? It's a very powerful effect. What other influences does prediction generation have on memory? There's a variety of positive ones. Right? One of the things, and I think this came out very nicely in a variety of people's examples, is that if you can provide predictions in ways that violate students' expectations, violation of expectation attracts attention, 
right? A lot of people argue that's the key reason we have consciousness, right? That we have a lot of ability to navigate our world, but what consciousness does is it checks what's going on against what we expect. And when things don't match, we pay attention, right? And so a violation of expectation, I'm expecting something to happen in the classroom, I'm expecting X or Y, that violation of expectation is very memorable, right? And so predictions where you essentially lead students in a particular way or you get them to act on their particular expectations and then violate them become more memorable, right? And you have broad different ways to do this. There's things that violate student personal expectations, categorical expectations about events or um, people or just broadly unusual things. Right, so things in human perception that people notice a lot are when people do things that are extreme or, uh, or very negative. Things that don't happen normally in human interaction are highly noticeable, precisely because they violate our expectations for how people perform. Right, so if I stepped up on the table, right, it's a very memorable thing. Right, and even though you might not remember a lot of the other things that I do today, you remember I got on the table because it violates the general expectations in the classroom. Um, and hopefully it'll break my leg. Okay. Um, the other thing that it does is it creates goals. Right? It creates goals for the students to attend to and it directs them towards particular information. So the key is the goal, the key is to create prediction or predictive exercises that helps guide students to the things you want them to attend to. Not just anything. Right, but to the specific things in the instruction in the classroom that you want them to watch for. <clears throat> a good way to think about this is to think about the different things you remember depending on what goals you have when you interact with someone. If you're meeting someone in a coffee shop and you're thinking about, well, are we going to have a second date or not? Or you're evaluating them as a job candidate for your department. The things that you select and attend to in that interaction are exceptionally different, right? Based on the goal, based on what you're looking for in that environment, based on how you're predicting that's going to go. And so it's very important that the goals that you're leading students to through the predictive exercise are the ones that you want. Um, the other thing, the type matters, right? So one of the things we keep coming back to in this, uh, in this uh, workshop is the idea that depth of processing or how carefully or uh, the extent to which you elaborate material matters for memory. And so goals that get people to attend to surface details, like I want you to predict how many buttons are going to be on a person's coat, right? That doesn't give you any rich or elaborate processing, or I want you to predict the number of vowels that are going to happen in the sentence. You want things that encourage deep thinking about the issue. <clears throat> the other really nice thing that's very powerful, right, is it just dramatically increases the accessibility of the information, right? That's part of the power of Wegner's work. These things become, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm reaching for the word, I'm getting blocked by a, a, a competing word, um, chronically accessible, right? That is, because you keep coming back to it, it becomes something that comes to you all the time. Right? And each time it's brought to mind, the stronger it gets and the more likely it is to come to mind again. Um, and a very important one for education, and that is it protects against hindsight bias. Hindsight bias is this dramatic effect that you see when you provide people with information, they tend to really go, well, I would have guessed that, or I knew that all along. Right? That once you tell them the results of something interesting, that in your field of study, no one thought was true before. When you tell them the results, students go, oh, of course. It couldn't have come out any other way. And so what prediction does is it forces students to face having to make a judgment before they know the results. Right? And that's a very powerful thing. Hindsight bias is very difficult for students to deal with because everything feels obvious once they've learned what happened. But that doesn't help them predict what's going to happen the next time. Right? It doesn't give them information about how much they actually know, because it always seems like, well, that was easy to understand. That was obvious. And giving them some sense of uh, or get, ha helping protect them against that hindsight bias can be very powerful. 
there are some dangers, especially at retrieval. Uh, T.S. Eliot talks about April coming up. Uh, when we retrieve information from memory, right, most of us think of it as this relatively straightforward process, right, as if we're going to some place on a hard drive and we're retrieving something that's fixed. It's not at all like that, right? The state that you're in, the desires, the motivations, the moods, all of those things, right, in, in, a, very, in a variety of ways, anything that's happened between the event and the retrieval influences how you retrieve that. <clears throat> so what happens is prediction can have dramatic effects on how you influence what you retrieved, how you interpret it, uh, and can be influenced sub subtly in ways that people aren't aware of. There's great research by Elizabeth Loftus on the uh, basically imputation of false memories by questions at retrieval that introduce <coughs> expectations, right? So in a variety of very cool studies, two of my favorites are, she would bring people in with a parent or a guardian or a loved one and ostensibly be interviewing them separately. Right? So they would falsely interview the parent or loved one first, and then they would interview the student. And they would say, okay, so tell me what it was like. Tell me how you felt when you were lost in the mall as a child. Right? So the implication is you've just had your parent or guardian share the story that you don't remember. Right? And so what happened? About half the students said, well, I don't remember that. But another half, started to generate, based on what they expected that would be like, what that experience was for them. Right? And they, make, they made, one of the things that they actually did do in the parent interviews is confirm that to their knowledge that had never happened. Right? That they had never left their child in a mall. Um, and so what happened is not only do they create all these details from their theories about what it's like and their expectations of what it's like, but then when they're quizzed later, weeks later, Right? Even after they're told that that was not true, they continue to remember those details as if they're true. Right? So if you plant memories that are problematic through generating expectations, it's hard to get rid of them. The other thing that that can do that can be problematic in the classroom is it activates theories, schemas, stereotypes that you may not want to have out in the classroom. You may, you may not, but it's something you have to be aware of. As soon as you're generating, having students generate their own expectations and beliefs, those expectations and beliefs can come from all kinds of ways, right? Cultural stereotypes you want to engage with and debunk or work on, great. But if you're, that's not what your goal is in that activity, you need to be prepared for that happening. <clears throat> and then one of the most problematic things, right? is that one of the things that can happen is students can remember what they predicted, not the actual fact at the end, right? So you have to be very careful at the end of the process when you actually come back and you provide the facts, right? To make sure that they've learned the facts because you've given them a lot of memorial activity centered around remembering their prediction, right? And if their predictions are wrong and based on stereotypes or false memories or their active schemas or scripts, you're reinforcing all those things. So it's a very, you have to be very careful how you use these types of things. It's very powerful, lots of attentional benefits, lots of memorial benefits, but there are risks. The other thing that happens, uh, it's in this general sense of things, people have really remarkable expectations about whether or not things change or don't change, right? And so when you have them generate predictions around those things, right? So if you're, how did something change in, uh, you know, how did the GDP in the United States change over time, right? They have expectations that some types of things change and that some types of things are stable. And human perception, one of the problems that we face a lot of psychologists is people have this traumatic expectation that people don't change, right? That they have very stable personalities over long periods of time. And so what happens is, even if you provide evidence, even if you try and debunk the fact of that consistency, people just believe that that person is the same person underneath, right? Unless you allow them to cross a watershed a bit, right? Unless you allow them to cross something where people have theories about remarkable change. And then they exaggerate the change based on their theories of change. So if you say, well, why was this person 
before or after a divorce or before or after adolescence, right? People have these really rich, detailed schemas about how everything changes in those, right? The state that you're in, the desires, the motivations, the moods, all of those things, right? And in, in, in a variety of ways, anything that's happened between the event and the retrieval influences how you retrieve that. <clears throat> so what happens is prediction can have dramatic effects on how you influence what you retrieve, how you interpret it, uh, and can be influenced subtly in ways that people aren't aware of. There's great research by Elizabeth Loftus on the uh, basically imputation of false memories by questions at retrieval that introduce <laughs> expectations, right? So in a variety of very cool studies, two of my favorites are, she would bring people in with a parent or a guardian or a loved one and ostensibly be interviewing them separately, right? So they would falsely interview the parent or loved one first, and then they would interview the student. They would say, okay, so tell me what it was like. Tell me how you felt when you were lost in the mall as a child, right? So the implication is, You've just had your parent or guardian share the story that you don't remember, right? And so what happened? About half of students said, well, I don't remember that. But another half started to generate, based on what they expected that would be like, what that experience was for them, right? And they, make, they made, one of the things that they actually did do in the parent interviews is confirm that to their knowledge that had never happened, right? That they had never left their child in a mall. Um, and so what happened is not only do they create all these details from their theories about what it's like and their expectations of what it's like, but then when they're quizzed later, weeks later, right, even after they're told that that was not true, they continue to remember those details as if they're true, right? So if you plant memories that are problematic through generating expectations, it's hard to get rid of them. The other thing that that can do that can be problematic in the classroom is it activates theories, schemas, stereotypes that you may not want to have out in the classroom. You may, you may not, but it's something you have to be aware of. As soon as you're generating, having students generate their own expectations and beliefs, those expectations and beliefs can come from all kinds of ways, right? Cultural stereotypes you want to engage with and debunk or work on, great. But if you're, that's not what your goal is in that activity, you need to be prepared for that happening. <clears throat> and then one of the most problematic things, right, is that one of the things that can happen is students can remember what they predicted, not the actual fact at the end, right? So you have to be very careful at the end of the process when you actually come back and you provide the facts, right, to make sure that they've learned the facts because you've given them a lot of memorial activity centered around remembering their prediction, right? And if their predictions are wrong and based on stereotypes or false memories or their active schemas or scripts, you're reinforcing all those things. So it's a very, you have to be very careful how you use these types of things. It's very powerful, lots of attentional benefits, lots of memorial benefits, but there are risks. The other thing that happens, uh, it's in this general sense of things, people have really remarkable expectations about whether or not things change or don't change, right? And so when you have them generate predictions around those things, right, so if you're, how did something change in, uh, you know, how did the GDP in the United States change over time, right? They have expectations that some types of things change and that some types of things are stable. And human perception, one of the problems that we face a lot of psychologists, is people have this traumatic expectation that people don't change, right? That they have very stable personalities over long periods of time. And so what happens is, even if you provide evidence, even if you try and debunk the fact of that consistency, people just believe that that person is the same person underneath, right? Unless you allow them to cross a watershed a bit. Right? Unless you allow them to cross something where people have theories about remarkable change. And then they exaggerate the change based on their theories of change. So if you say, well, why was this person before or after a divorce or before or after adolescence? Right? People have these really rich, detailed schemas about how everything changes in those types of situations. And so what happens is when you look at their perceptions based on their expectations, 
they dramatically exaggerate how much change happens in those situations or overestimate. <clears throat> There's a variety of other things that happen as you do this that can lead to, way, lead to situations that aren't helpful to you in the classroom. So it's, it's important to watch out for them. So as you have them generate predictions, one of the things that human beings do very naturally is we look for answers that confirm that we're right. right? We do not look for answers that confirm or that disprove us or that would tell us that we're wrong. We're great at looking for evidence that we're awesome, that we're correct, very smart, but not so good for finding out, searching out, and remembering evidence that we're wrong, right? And so you've had them generate expectations. They are going to be motivated to look in your lecture, to look in your instructional material for evidence that fits their beliefs, that confirms that, in fact, they are geniuses, right? So you have to be aware of that. If it's situations where students can shape the outcome, right, if you're having them generate predictions about their behavior or about behavior of others that they're going to interact with, our expectations about people's behavior, about things that happen to us, shape what we do, right? And so having them generate predictions about behavior will actually change how they're likely to behave, right? So it's careful to watch out for those types of effects as well. <clears throat> I already alluded to this a little bit. Human beings are believing machines, right? We just flat believe stuff. And it's very hard in the face of incontrovertible evidence to update your beliefs in a lot of situations, right? So if you're having students generate predictions, right, outlining their beliefs, they're going to be searching for evidence that they're right. And even when you give them evidence that they're wrong, they may not change their minds, right? Lots of classic studies in this. I'm sure you can think of great examples of this in your personal life. Most people have all of a sudden reach to political opponents for when they think about these types of things, about how even in the face of evidence, we talked about this in great detail, they don't change their mind. Well, we all do, don't change our minds very well, right? The, the first study on this looked at people's estimations of how risk-taking is related to being a good firefighter. Some people were told, Risk takers are very good firefighters. We'd like you to write an essay about why you think that's true. There's lots of evidence, but we, we want your opinion. So tell us why you think that's true. Other people are told, you know, risk taking is actually associated with being not a very good firefighter. Right? There's research that suggests that it actually makes you a worse firefighter. Explain why you think that's true. Right? Both people wrote very or both sets of students wrote very convincing essays about why firefighter was or was not related positively to risk taking. And then at the end of the study, right, they said, oh, by the way, we made that up. There's actually no re research at all on this. We have no idea whether or not there's any relationship between risk taking and firefighting. As far as we can tell from the available evidence, there's no relationship, right? So of course, a couple weeks later, contact the students again, and they asked, well, we just wanted to check. Right? We told you that it was false. What do you think the relationship is? Right? The students who generated all these explanations, these expectations about the relationship, if they were in the positive condition, they said, you know what? I know you said it was false, but that makes sense to me. It must be true that risk taking is associated with being a better firefighter. And if they were in the negative condition, even though they were told it was false, right? it must be true. Risk taking is it's bad. Right? You, you, you take too many risks, you jump into fires you shouldn't, right? They were able to generate beliefs. And even when you took away the thing that generated the belief in the first place, they had constructed all this other stuff to keep that belief in place. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the thing that we talked about when we talked about Zygarnik brings us back to one of the other dangers. And it's a very specific subset of dangers with relation to closure, right? It's very psychologically important to students. Students really want it, right? If you think about how having unfinished tasks influence your kind of ongoing stress, right? Having lots of things that you have to keep track of and keep popping up, it's very stressful. Students don't like to have lots of things that they have to keep track of that keep popping up and intruding in the classroom. 
right? So it's psychologically important for them. They want it. It feels good, right? Remember from last week, you get this positive boost from closure, right? And so if you don't have that, absence produces stress, frustration, annoyance because of the potential for intrusion to, to other tasks you're working on. But the downside is once you actually close that loop with the predictions, it releases a lot of the memory effects, right? This is what we worry about with tests, right? Once they take the test, once they've done the assessment, they just release the information and don't come back to it. Yes? Why wouldn't an expectation of, say, a final exam that's going to test on everything, why wouldn't that keep it alive until at least then? That's an awesome question, right? <laughs> so the first thing you want to do, right, this speaks exactly to how you want to structure tests. Cumulative exams are an absolute must for this type of problem. If you want students to remember information from the beginning of the semester at least to the end of your class, you have to have a cumulative exam. If you do not have a cumulative exam that basically communicates to students, we've closed that loop, everyone, you don't have to remember it anymore. Absolutely. You mean every exam is cumulative? Or? Well, at the very least, the final needs to be cumulative, right? You can, do, you can do individual ones, but to the extent that they have these intermediate steps, which they're told they don't need to have that previous information, that'll make it harder for the final. I've started doing five extra credit items on each subsequent test on previous material. As I, you know. I was thinking of incorporating old stuff into, because I usually I break it up into chunks and test five exams, and then the mm -hmm. final's cumulative, and a lot of them say I don't remember anything now. So I'm trying to figure out how I can design the test a little differently, but somehow to not stress them out too much to, right you know, for learning the new stuff, so. It's a, it's a tough balance, but basically, if the middle exams are cumulative, you are essentially communicating to, communicating to them that at least for now, all that stuff is done. And so that, I think that's a good balance, right? Having something that says, there is gonna be stuff, make sure you keep it relevant, don't forget. That may be enough. I just integrated this really, this um, cool thing that seems to be working unexpectedly, which is that they can make up half of the points they missed on their first exam by meeting orally, meeting it after class, and orally going through the objectives again. So they, they have to go through and correct their exams, but then they have to meet in a group, and, we, and then I just pepper them with questions from all the objectives. And then they get to do that for the midterm too, but not the final. But not the final. Well, at least, for, I mean, for those that allows them, that tells them right away, Right, that I need to keep this memory, yeah. that I need to keep this material current. Right, the task isn't that, over. Yeah, the, the, the oral part seems really interesting because they seem to be really fired up about it. It, it. it keeps them, I don't know, like alert in a different way, which I've never seen before in the classroom. Right, but you've experienced it in the classroom, right? How do you feel when you're up in front of a classroom with students talking? Well, I'm sweating right now. <laughs> right, <laughs> and it's the same thing for them, right? right it's the same right. thing for them. Yeah. It's the same thing for them. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, I don't know if any of you guys ever watched these. Well, I had a grandfather that made me go back and watch some of this stuff with him. Um, one of the ways they used to handle this uh, was cliffhangers, right? That is, you'd have a cliffhanger in these serials, right? Where it would, in, in some cases, they would literally were cliffhangers, right? The guy would be hanging off the edge of the cliff almost every week. But so what they did is they would have closure of the previous cliffhanger, right? You don't, you get away from that one, you get this partial closure, and then you get a new cliffhanger, right? And so that's how you try to hook your material. You want stuff that gives students some of the psychological benefits that we've closed the loop, but there's still something hanging, right? There's still another piece, right? That you can bring them in. And so building things into your lecture that allow you to say, or build, that build, you, build into your class arc that allow you to say, we're, we're engaging this now, right, and this will be on the test, but I want to alert you to the fact that this is going to be really important for chapter four, right, which will be on the next test, right, and that's the, the type of things that you see in elementary schools with spiral review, they're doing the same thing, right, they're constantly alerting kids that this material is going to come back, right, and we're going to re-engage it in new ways, in slightly different ways, and so students learn that, Right, that I can't just discard stuff, mm -hmm. that, I, that it's going to keep coming back, they're more likely to remember it, and you give them a little bit of a break and say, but you know, we did close a little bit off for you, so you can kind of calm down on that a little bit. 
So one of the things that came up is people had generated different predictive exercises that we talked about. And there was one concern that someone had about um, they had uh, a true-false predictive exercise. And they were worried that they had too many false things on their exercise. So I just want to kind of go over what some good goals that you could use based on what we understand about the brain to build these things. Right? So someone was worried about that. One of the things that you can do, right, remember all the dangers we just talked about, right, is you frame it in ways that their expectations or stereotypes push them to the wrong answers. Right? So whatever they are, whatever the answers are, you can set it up so that their expectations are going to be violated. Now you're going to have to clean that up, right? You're going to have to make sure. Remember how you predicted this? It was false. It's still false. Remember last time how you predicted all these false things? You have, to, you have to correct those beliefs. The other thing is when in doubt, go with false, right? If you're having people predict, have the right answer be false, people believe things. We're believing machines. We talked about that a little bit. There's great work by Dan Gilbert that um, basically comprehension and belief, that is endorsement or agreement with the thing you comprehend, are simultaneous. Right? That is, understanding something is false takes extra work. We don't do that very well. Right? We have to essentially kind of tag the source and say, remember this thing that you learned? That's wrong. Right? And that's an additional step. And there's lots of things that can interfere with that. That's why people believe stuff that they read in things like the National Enquirer or other tabloids, right? They automatically believe stuff. A lot of them go, well, within the Enquirer, so you can't really believe that. But what happens is, because that belief and comprehension go together so strongly, you lose the falseness of it over time. And you're left with the belief. So if you want to engage students in a way that are going to, they'll generate predictions that um, you can violate their expectations with, false is the way to go. I just wanted to say, it's such, I, it's, it, yeah, I can't let go of this. One of the greatest examples of that belief of perseverance is uh, this new 13th sign in astrology. So it's so interesting to me. I mean, I know PhDs that are, you know, discussing signs and, oh, this person's a Libra. And A, we look for all the qualities that Libras are in the person. And B, confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. Right. And B, when we are now told, well, you know, that's all askew now to the, w because we have this 13th sign and now you're actually a Sagittarius or whatever it is. No, I, I, I talked to a friend who was a PhD. Well, no, there was no, it just didn't confirm her <laughs> ideas about it. And she said, well, I've always thought of it as just a poetic understanding of the sensibilities. I said, not when you were saying, I'm only going to date men that are air signs, you know, that you were making these grand predictions about who you were compatible with and now it just it doesn't fit with her schema and she doesn't know where to put it and so the falseness of it we don't she just lets it go even yeah. even though she's very cognitively complex person mm -hmm. she has to let it go and that's why we say believing is seeing not seeing is believing Right. <laughs> right? I mean, your belief, it, then we call it selective perception in comp studies. You know, you, you, it, then you winnow it down to those things which are consistent with your expectation. And it's pernicious. You don't even know you're doing it when you do it. Not at all. Yeah. And the vast majority of time, your phenomena, phenomenological reality is that you have not filtered anything. <laughs> right? And which gets us, which leads to a lot of the conflicts we have with each other, with our students, yes. right? Because we believe we are leave, living a completely unfiltered life, right? We experience it as unfiltered. It's not been filtered through our biases. But they clearly don't believe the same thing, so they must have some kind of filter or bias built into their perceptual process. And you probably see this in your students quite often. People are dramatically overconfident. So what I'm going to do is if you could get out a sheet of paper. I'm not. I don't know. I don't know. Let me just help you guys out. I don't feel confident at all. So what, what your goal is in this task is to correctly calibrate, calibrate your confidence in your answers so that you get 9 out of 10 things right. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a question and you're going to generate an interval. You're going to generate a high guess and a low guess. 
And you should be, and the correct answer should be between your high guess and your low guess 90% of the time. Right? So I'm going to give you 10. You should be able to get the correct answer between your high guess and your low guess 9 out of 10 times. Right? So everyone, so if I was going to ask you to guess, um, uh, try, I'm, I'm, uh, the last time the Milwaukee Brewers went to the World Series. Okay, so you would want to choose, if you don't know, right, you want to make sure that you choose a wide interval, right, because you don't know when that is, but if you have a pretty good idea, you choose a narrower interval. Does that make sense? So if you, if you don't know, well, baseball's been around by, for like 100 years, so it has to be sometime between now and 1900, right? That would be a reasonable interval in a situation where you don't know anything, right? Interval as large as you want. Right. If, but you want to be as calibrated as you can, right? You don't want to be underconfident. You're trying to match your confidence so you can get it in there nine out of 10 times. Okay, so the best guess is you can without being overconfident uh, or being underconfident. So you should aim for no more than one uh, correct answer falling outside of your interval. Okay? Uh, and, right, people always say, wow, this doesn't really matter. I'm going to make it matter. $10. I'm going to give it to Tricia to give to the person who's the best calibrated, right? So the person who's the best calibrated, getting 9 out of 10 right. And if it's tie, we'll go to the person who has the highest precision, their smallest overall intervals. Okay? All right, here we go. So the high guess and the low guess. Your correct answer should be between your two guesses. The year John Wayne won the Best Actor Academy Award for True Grit. You just give me that 10 bucks now. All right, we'll see. There was some range to the questions. <laughs> so you need a high guess that you believe that is higher than the actual year and a low guess that you believe is lower Can than I the actual year. Can ask you a question? Yes. Uh, are these things that actually happen? Yes. All of them have correct answers, yes. Good. So in fact, if you're asking, did John Wayne win the best actor for True Get? He did. Who knew, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not looking go. Okay, does everyone have a high and a low guess? Yes. Excellent, okay. Number of times the New York Yankees won the World Series between 1903 and 1995. Oh, the number of times the New York Yankees won the World Series between 1903 and 1995. But the, the, the width of the interval doesn't matter. That's right. right. Well, it only matters if there's a tie. If there's a tie, it matters. Right? So you've you got $10 on the line here. That's lunch, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where you eat lunch. Um, the number of books in the New Testament. King James, I think, is this one, if it matters. <laughs> I had someone go through to one of my classes and actually sit there and recite them all. It was pretty wow. remarkable. Wow. wow. Oh, all. The whole the whole all, clue. all the books and counted them as they recited them, yeah. Nice. How many did he count? <laughs> <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Are you guys ready? Yeah. Okay. Median income for U.S. households in 1998. The median income for U.S. households, households in 1998. The year the floppy disk was invented by IBM. Oh, sorry, still working on the number of, or the median income, sorry. Median income. <laughs> yes, so the floppy disks, remember the five and a quarter ones yes. that were actually floppy? Yeah. Oh, you guys remember disks? <laughs> Wait, so U.S. households, you're counting both parents or whatever? Any, any U.S. household. So it would, a single parent would be a household. So all U.S. households. That's from the census. 1998. All right, so then we have the year the floppy disk was invented by IBM.
Which floppy disk are you talking? The about? five and a quarter floppy. Five and a the quarter. The five and a quarter floppy. Yeah. The ones that you used to be able to use a, a hole punch well, you to could punch have out the one side. The little hard ones, you know, the three and a half. No, no, that's not actually a floppy disk. But those are were called floppy disks. Incorrect. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, go ahead and use that one. No, the five and a quarter inch floppy disks. The hole punch. Remember the whole punch to make it a double sided? Oh, everyone was like, oh, this is genius. I just doubled my disk storage capacity to 128K. <laughs> I still don't know what that means. <laughs> okay, the average number of days per year where the minimum temperature is below freezing in Juneau, Alaska. Wait, what? So, across time, how many days per year on average is the low temperature in Juneau, Alaska below freezing? 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius, depending on how you like your temperature. So the average number of days per year where the minimum temperature, the low temperature is below freezing in Juneau, Alaska. Okay? Mm -hmm. Four to go. The age Abraham Lincoln was when he was assassinated. <laughs> the age Abraham Lincoln was when he was assassinated. I'm trying to hit all kinds of fields. Sports. When's going to be the anatomy field? The anatomy, <laughs> the anatomy doesn't shy. lend itself. To, you know what? If we could have done bones, the number of bones in the oh, body. That would have been a good one. The population of the United States in the year 2000. So I'll just give you a hint. One year someone put 300 billion. That's wow. not right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my it was 300 billion was their low guess, and their high guess was 450 billion. So. Wow. Yes. That was a lot of. That was all. Population of the United States in the year 2000. If you flew by air from New York to Miami, the air miles, right? So not driving, but the, as the crow flies, the distance from New York to Miami. As the crow flies. Right, so the air miles, right? So you're not doing up and down and side to side. Basically a straight line. Yeah, a straight line. One to go. Is it an exciting one? I don't think so. Any, any literature people in the room? Which literature people in the room? No? All right. This, one, this won't be easy. So, uh, oops, that was it. The year William Shakespeare was born. Approximately. Right? Assuming that William Shakespeare is real and he published everything that he said, what is our rough estimate of the year he was born? I need to drop out. <laughs> <laughs> but you were so confident at the beginning. I was a joke. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, if you want, take a chance. Look over your answers if you like. I'll give you a minute. Yes, the actual answers are hard. So, here are the correct answers. Right? So, you get a point for the thing if that answer is within your interval, including your interval. Oh, wow. So, that helps you a little bit. So, if you said 1969 on either end, you got one point for true grit. Right? So, you won for true grit in 1969. You get one point. What do you mean you got just right? Uh, no, so if one of your intervals was 1969, that counts. Right. So within, including both sides. Okay, if 1969 is within your interval. Yes. What if you were said between 1940 Then you get a point. Okay. Right? So if you said 1900 to now, you get a point. Right? Okay. You wouldn't be very well calibrated. Did you get one? But you, 
Right, but the tiebreaker goes to people who are closer. But right. we hope we don't have to do We almost never, I've only ever, ever had to break the tie once. The, the number of times the New York Yankees were in the World Series during that time period was 22. I'm sorry, won the World Series between 1903 and 1995. They were the winningest team in that period. Okay. I've already got missed the books in the New Testament, there are 27. I'm waiting. <laughs> the median income in, oh. what year was that? In uh, 1998 was 29,000. Oh. Oh. So close. The median income, $240. Yeah, I got one right. The floppy disk was invented by IBM in 1970. Yay. Oh. Yes. I just got it. Yeah. <laughs> Students almost never get this right. Because <laughs> that, that for them is like two lifetimes ago. Juno is cold 142 oh. days a year. The minimum temperature is below freezing. Temperature below 365. Lincoln's age at assassination 56. Oh. Yay. People think he was older. I think he was 46. I thought he was younger. I thought he was younger. The population of the United States in 2000 was 283,500,000. As estimated by the U.S. Census. Air miles from New York City to Miami, 1,095. That's a surprise. And the last one, William Shakespeare, by best estimates, was born in the year 1564. Nine! Nine! Nine. 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 Let me let me uh, let me ask you a question. How big are your intervals? Rather large. Rather large. <laughs> That's kind of a personal question. No, not 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 gigantic. Okay. No, not gigantic. Actually, my biggest my biggest uh, span was the one that I got wrong. It wasn't okay. big enough. Well, one of the things that happens, so I, I've done this in psych and econ classes, and usually I get at least one hardcore econ student who's like, I know exactly how to win this. Right? And so what they do is they make the widest possible intervals for nine of them, and then they make sure the other one's wrong. And that way they're perfectly calibrated to nine out of ten within their interval. Right? It kind of violates the spirit of the game, but nonetheless wins, typically. But what happens is how many, so let's see, so we had one at nine, eight, one at eight, seven, six. So, so far we've got four people at six or better. Remember, you're supposed to have nine out of ten inside. Five? Okay, we've got about, oh, about half that. the class now. Four? Three? One at three? Anyone less than three? Two. Two. This is when we had a big discussion about the conference. You know, normally when you do this, you don't warn them so much about... Right, no, I definitely yeah. overwarn, but yeah. Yeah. it's this really powerful thing. And so yeah. one of the yeah. things that happens, right, is if you do this in the classroom, it gets students to really think about how much they know and how well they know it. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that students do very poorly is do the meta assessment of their knowledge, right? And so as a predictive instrument, this becomes very powerful. It doesn't get you necessarily into the true false area where you're reaffirming false beliefs. It gives this broad latitude. And it also helps them to think about how well they know things and gives them some realization that they are probably pretty overconfident within their guesses or estimates, right? As we all are. There, there's great work by um, Russo and Shoemaker. Uh, they did it with Harvard MBAs, put actual big dollars on the line between $500,000 in some of the studies and had them make estimations. You know, same kind of thing. How is this going to work out? Give us your 90% confidence interval. They were on average 48% correct. They did it with physicians, right? If you're given these symptoms, give us the confidence interval around how likely this person is to have a particular illness, right? Life on the line, physicians only constructed confidence intervals that were 90% correct 40% of the time, right? So they only got four out of 10 within the window. We just are overconfident as people and we don't realize it, right? And one of our job as educators is to help students properly calibrate their confidence in their knowledge 
to their level of knowledge, right? Or if you want to think about it more kind of uh, gorilla-like, to bring their level of knowledge up to their overplaced confidence, right? <laughs> but either way, part of our job is to try and get those things better calibrated. And this makes for a very predictive and power powerful exercise. I find that putting money on the line, it doesn't have to be very much, motivates students a lot to pay attention and remember it. So that's one of the things that I always did. So uh, that's all I have for things that you can use with prediction and expectations. And so that leaves us a little bit of time for the um, going around the room for the homework. Thank you. Thank you.